All righty. Well, let's get started with the service tonight. Good to see everybody here this evening. All right. Take your Bible to the book of Jonah, if you would please. Our final lesson here in the book of Jonah. Lord willing, next Wednesday we're going to start a new new study about the disciples of Jesus and um, study each of those men. These are men that made a difference. No doubt about it. These are men that the Bible says turned the world upside down. And uh, so we'll begin to study their lives, and I think you'll enjoy that on Wednesday evenings in the coming weeks. All right? Here in Jonah chapter 4, again, great revival has taken place in Nineveh. Everyone has repented from the king all the way down to the poorest of the people, as well as uh, even the animals. Uh, they, they put sackcloth on and didn't allow them to eat, and they put a fast and and, and so the God repented and did not judge Nineveh. And uh, every, listen, the people are happy. God is happy. God is pleased. The angels are rejoicing. But Jonah is mad. Jonah is angry. And it says in verse 1, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before thee unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of a great kindness, and repenteth thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Father, we bow before you in prayer tonight, and I pray that you would open our understanding now as we once again uh, look at this last chapter in the book of Jonah and particularly look at the resentment that Jonah had towards you for what you had done to the Ninevites. And Lord, I, I would pray that you would help tonight uh, anyone in the room that might have resentment, that they would identify it, that they would be willing to admit, admit they have it, and that, Lord, they would deal with it, and they would ask forgiveness for it. And Lord, you would be gracious and you would pardon them. And Lord, what a freedom, what a joy, what, what, what peace could come to their heart. I pray you'd use the lesson this evening in that way to be a help to the people of God. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Well, Jonah struggles here with resentment. He couldn't stand the fact the Ninevites were receiving God's blessing. God does not judge them like He wanted them to. God didn't destroy them like Jonah wanted them to. And so Jonah is angry with God. He's very resentful. And uh, let, me, let me remind you of this. We, we don't control revival. God does. Revival is not something man ever works up. Revival is something God brings down. It's on God's part. You and I, we, we don't control the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We quench. We can quench the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. And Jonah is doing that by his resentment. I think one of the main ways you can quench the Spirit in your life and one of the main ways you'll quench his working in your life is through the sin of resentment. Listen carefully to me, will you please? What's your response when someone else has what you want? Is it rejoicing or is it resentment? What's your response when a fellow worker gets recognized for their hard work and they get a raise or they get a bonus? But nobody says anything about your hard work. Is there rejoicing? Or is there resentment? How do you feel when another Christian achieve, achieves what seems to be a higher level of outward success than you do? Maybe, maybe a nicer home. Maybe, maybe a pretty lavish vacation. Maybe an early retirement. Maybe better health. What's your response? Is it rejoicing? Or is it resentment? What's your heart response when 
your friends tell you they have some great news and it's happened to them. Do you rejoice it's happened to them or do you say, how come nothing like that ever happens to me? Rejoicing or resentment? Do you say good for them? Or do you say, why didn't it happen to me? Oh, you see, resentment is married. Its spouse's name is envy. And they have a child. The child's name is bitterness. They're all in the same family. Envy is the resentment that another person is enjoying something that you would like but don't have. The overweight woman envies the thin woman. The financially struggling man envies the fellow who retires at 55 and is set for life. The single woman envies the happily married woman, wife and mother. And sometimes the wife and the mother of three small children envies the freedom of the single woman. Well, what does the Bible... <clears throat> how, does, how does God deal with resentment? What does the Bible say about this? Resentment is a, is a word that literally means an intense feeling. When you resent something or feels to the feeling pain and indignation due to an injustice or an insult. You feel resentful, I feel resentful when we feel like we've been wrong. We can, might be an action, might be a statement, might be a person. Oftentimes we get resentful to an authority, authoritative figure in our life it might be a parent could be a pastor could be a teacher somebody who would have authority authority figure in our life but resentment someone said is all emotion and no strength but we feel like or we perceive that we've been treated unfairly by another person But resentment stems from a love of the things of the world. I could say it stems from a love of self and a lack of faith in God and His plan. You know, everybody at some point in your life is going to be treated how you perceive unfairly. It will happen to everyone. You won't escape it. Don't think you're something special because you got treated unfairly. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And so you can recognize unfair treatment and you can realize that it's happened, but you wallow in those feelings of self-righteous anger and it'll become bitterness and you will defile many and you'll destroy yourself. You know, the Bible's not concerned with honoring your human pride. I cringe when I hear people say, well, I got my pride. Is that really what you want to go for? When God says, six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto Him, and the very first thing is a proud look. When you have that intense emotional response of resentment to an otherwise harmless insult, it shows a great lack of spiritual maturity and a great love for self. David, when he fled Jerusalem, when Absalom was doing the, his rebellion, 
and uh, David left the palace there. As he was leaving, a fella came out, and mighty, that David's mighty men are with him, but this little fella named Shimei took up stones and began to throw them at David. Picked up rocks. And a couple of David's mighty men said, want to take care of this kid? I mean, uh, I think one of them said, we'll hit him once, it won't take twice. Okay? And, and David said, remember what David said? David said, yeah, I'm the king. What's he doing doing that to me? David didn't say that. David said, let him alone. Yeah, but he's insulting you. He's cursing you. He's cussing you out, David. He's throwing stones at you. He said, maybe God told him to do that. He said, let him alone. He would not have him killed. David chose the path of humility. If he's cursing me, maybe the Lord told him to do it. In other words, David avoided him getting resentful by looking at the big picture that maybe God has something to do with this. Do you think when the insult happened to you, do you think when the wrong thing happened to you, do you think God wasn't looking? Do you think that, that, that God, God said, whoa, what's going on down there? No, 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 no. God's involved in our life and He that watches over you and me never slumbers or sleeps. Nothing takes Him by surprise. We can feel resentment even when God allows or orchestrates an injustice in the course of our life. And especially so sometimes when we're trying to live for God. We say, Lord, I'm serving You. Lord, I'm living for You. Lord, I'm trying to do what's right here. And this is what happens to me? And we can get resentful at God. But I'm reminded what Jesus said. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it ever hated you. I said to someone just the other day, when they were talking about some of the suffering and difficulties they're going through, I said, do you really want to do you really want to complain to Jesus about how much you're suffering? Do we really want to talk to Jesus about why should I suffer so much? The one who suffered what he did for you and me? Are we, are we above our Lord? That we, we should be able to serve him and live for him and never suffer? And by the way, we sometimes suffer rightfully so. But he always suffered wrongfully. Always did. None of us are immune to this disease of resentment that so ate up Jonah. Every one of us are subject to it. How does resentment, before I talk about how God dealt with his resentment, let's talk about what resentment does to us. How does resentment affect us? Well, number one, resentment will destroy our peace. Resentment destroys peace. I think, I think after everything Jonah went through, I mean being thrown overboard in the storm and spending three days and three nights in the belly of that whale and then being, you know, spit up on dry ground and looking like a bleached out, quite a sight, not sure what he was, and, and, and preaching. the. I think if anybody would have been happy that it's, at least it's over, it would have been Jonah. But he wasn't happy. He got a second chance. He got to see a great revival. When it says he was very angry, it literally means he was burning. You ever heard somebody say, that really burns me up? What are they saying? I'm burning with anger. That's where Jonah was. He was burning with anger. Last time I checked and read the book of Galatians, anger wasn't a fruit of the Spirit. In fact, it was a, fruit of, or it was a work of the flesh. 
The evidence of the person who's filled with the Spirit or yielded to the Spirit of God. In fact, the first three are love, joy, and peace. Jonah, in anger, prays the prayer of verse 2. And he really not asking God anything. He's just telling God what he wants to tell him. But it's interesting. What he says in his prayer. And I, he says, therefore, when he says, was not this my saying? When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled into Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God. In other words, I knew you were gracious. I knew you were merciful. I knew you were slow to anger. I knew you were a great kindness. I knew you repent of the evil. I knew, I knew, I knew. That's a contrast to Paul who didn't say I knew. Paul said, I know. There's a difference between the past tense and the present tense. What did Paul say? Uh, he said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. Romans 8.28 And we know all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are called in God's purpose. Jonah's completely living in the past. Jonah is not any reference to the present with God except anger. When you have anger, listen, when you have resentment in your heart, then any peace you talk about has to be from the past. Because where resentment dwells, peace does not dwell. You can't talk about any peace in your heart when resentment lives there. He had no, uh, he, he obeyed God, but he had no obedience in that. He had no joy in that obedience. And, and he's blaming God. God had nothing to do with that. Jonah did. Why are you blaming? Are you blaming God for problems that are really your fault? The last, uh, the is it the tenth principle in our you? God balances guilt with blame. So when we accept the blame, God will remove the guilt. As long as you're the victim. And well, well, if they wouldn't have done that, well, if he wouldn't have said this, if, if she wouldn't have done... And you're blaming everybody else. You're still carrying the guilt. Because you want to be the victim. And you don't have peace. Your peace is always from the past. What you knew. It's impossible for someone who's filled with anger and resentment to have peace in their heart. Peace in their life. It destroys our peace. Secondly, resentment will divert our purpose. You know, it's easy to see who Jonah was interested in. Let me ask you just a simple question. Was Jonah interested in God? No. Was he interested in Ninevites? No. Who was Jonah interested in? Jonah. Jonah's interested in Jonah himself. It's better for me. Notice in verse 3, my, take, I beseech thee, take my life from me. It is better for me to die than to live. Now he's making decisions about his life based on what he thinks is best for him. That's what resentment will do. It will divert your purpose. Many Christians have had their purposes diverted because things didn't go their way. And they allowed resentment to build up in their heart. Jonah's pride was crushed. He was hoping God would just destroy Nineveh so he could say, I told you so. Basically, twice in the chapter, he tells God, if I can't have it my way, just kill me. I'm better off dead. Just take my life away. I don't want to live. It's kind of like, you know, I'll just take my bat and ball and go home. Don't want to play my way. 
I guess he learned, he learned the Christian life isn't Burger King. You don't get to have it your way. We're here to have it God's way. It's, it's very similar to Elijah. Only Elijah wasn't after an uh, act of disobedience. With Elijah, it was after Mount Carmel when he took on the 400 prophets of Baal. He saw God answer with fire from heaven. Devour the sacrifice. A great victory. But then he ran away from Jezebel. And remember what he prayed? He wanted God to kill him. He wanted God to take, take his life. These men, listen, these are both, hey, both these men are prophets of God. Remember, Jonah had helped bring about a revival in Israel. These were, these were Elijah. These were great men of God, and yet they fell to this sin of resentment. And I'm sure if it could happen to them, it could happen to us. And their peace was destroyed. And their purpose was diverted. When we let resentment come in our heart, it destroys our peace, it diverts our purpose, and thirdly, it diminishes our productiveness. There's a couple things that really stand out. Jonah left the city of Nineveh. Here he is, he preached the message God told him to preach. He goes through the city preaching to them. This, by the way, on the second chance, God, the Word of the Lord came to him the second time. And great revival comes and they repent, they, they, they get saved and they believe in God. And if there's ever a time that Jonah needed to be in Nineveh, it would have been then. Don't you think these, these folks who just are humbled and wanting to be right with God and wanting to know what God expects of them, don't you think a prophet could have helped them? Okay, here's what you live, here's what you should do now. Do you, do you give birth to a, a baby and then just leave them on a doorstep? Do you just abandon them and walk away? Certainly not. And, and when, you, when you lead someone to Christ, your work isn't over, it's just beginning. You've just given birth there to a, to a newborn babe in Christ. Now, they need to grow and they need to be nurtured and they need to be helped and they need to be brought along. And Jonah doesn't, doesn't even worry about that, doesn't even think about that. He just goes out and sits by himself. They were left like sheep without a shepherd. No guidance and no teaching. But before you get too hard on Jonah, some of us sometimes have gone out of the city as well when we should have stayed put. We've, we've left to escape the burdens and heartaches of others when we should have stayed and tried to help and tried to minister to them. But in our resentment and self-centeredness, our productiveness was diminished. The other thing that's interesting, he didn't just go out of the city. He went out of the city and sat down. He sat. You ever think about how much of your life you spend sitting? We, we sit a lot at church. You think about that? Ladies came for Bible study night. What would you do? Sat down. You came into church and we... Sat down. Oh, you stand up to sing a song or so. And we open the Bible up and you sit down. By the way, that's okay. It, it, in, the, in the Old Testament, when they had the Bible and they read it from morning all the way till noon, what did all the people do? They stood up. They stood up and listened the whole time. We're too much of a couch potato generation for that to happen. Amen. Jonah is sitting. The city's rejoicing, but Jonah is sitting. Instead of, instead of rejoicing, listen, and people with resentment are like that. Other people are rejoicing and other people are happy and other people are thrilled at what God's doing and the resentful person is sitting there full of themselves. 
focused on themselves. Their productiveness and purpose are gone. Their sense of mission is gone. Their sense of usefulness is gone. Resentment diminishes your productiveness. When you're focused on yourself, you're not ministering to others. You're only thinking about you. Somebody may make a decision, somebody may get saved, but you don't know it because as soon as the amen was said, you wanted to get out as fast as you could. Just let me get out of church. Because it's about you. The last thing that we see about resentment here in this chapter is that it distorts our perspective. Here he was, he's not happy for the thousands in the city that have got right with God, the thousands city that, that had, have, have repented. You know what he's glad? He's glad for the gourd that God made. In verse 6, the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah. The gourd is like a plant that, that grew up, and so it gave him shade. It, it, it'd be a shadow over his head, deliver him from his grief. And Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. I think that's the only time we read in the whole place that Jonah's glad. That's the only time he got happy. Over a, 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 a plant that grew up over him and gave him some shade. How, how amazing how little it takes to make some people happy. And what it takes to make them happy. We talked about this before. I... We rejoice when someone receives Christ as their Savior. They make a profession of faith. They may follow the Lord in baptism and everybody applauds for them. But, but that's not quite as happy as you get when Ohio State scores a touchdown against Michigan. Oh, then, then we really get rejoicing. That's not quite, you know, how, how you rejoice when, 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 you, when you see things in a sporting event and people go crazy. Now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you need to turn church into a sporting event. Somebody said, you know, next time the preacher makes a great point, you know, pour a thing of Gatorade over his head or something like that. You know, that, <laughs> we're not going there, all right? We're not going to do that. But you understand, this is... What is it that gets you excited? How is it that I can be so pumped up and so excited and so into the game and so completely out of it at church? So completely disinterested at church? Oftentimes, I'll tell you what it is. Resentment. Resentment is residing in the heart. You can tell a lot about a person by observing what makes them happy and what makes them mad. Oftentimes, like we said, resentment springs from a belief that someone, even God, often God, is being unfair and not giving what is due. In Acts chapter 8, there was a uh, sorcerer, Simon the sorcerer, a magician, he, he really had a following of people because he could do sorcery. He could do magic stuff. And he did it by demonic power. And till Paul came along. And when Paul came along, folks got saved. And Simon himself made a profession of faith. Why? He wanted the power that Paul had. And he didn't get it. And he was not happy about not getting it. You see, he wanted the power that, I said Paul, Peter and John had. In fact, 
Remember what he wanted to do? He wanted to pay him for it. He wanted to give him money. Remember what Peter said to him? He said, you are in the gall of bitterness. He's angry at God. He lost what he thought he deserved to have. Lost his following, and he wanted what they had. And he couldn't get it. It's easy to resent God when we see Him blessing others while we suffer. And if you feed resentment long enough, it'll turn into bitterness. You'll see everything is a hardship. Everything in life is difficult. Even blessings that God tries to give you. And then eventually you won't see God in your life anywhere. You just won't see that God's doing anything in your life. Even though He is. Your perspective gets distorted. You know, you can, you can take a coin out of your pocket And you know something? If I take that penny and I hold that penny close enough to that eye, that's all I'll see is that penny. And I miss everything else. That's what happens when you allow resentment to stay in your life. Pretty soon it just keeps growing and growing and growing and then you can't see anything else. All you see is that. It distorts your perspective. And it's easy trap to fall into. We become more concerned about the gourd than we are people. More concerned about our comfort and our care than we are about the care of the needs of others. We're here on this earth after salvation. For two purposes. Number one is to know God. And number two is to make Him known. We're to know God and we're to make Him known to the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our job. And to know Him. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. And if we're not doing that, we're doing a disservice to God. Well, how did God respond to Jonah? Now I know, thankfully, we're going to see how God responds because I think I know how I would have. And it wouldn't have been pretty. But thank God, He responded in three ways. Number one, God responded with patience. When Jonah said, hey, it's better for me to die than to live, God could have said, okay, you're done. Couldn't he? Sure. Jeremiah said in Lamentations, it's of his mercies that we are not consumed. He responded with patience. Why, why, why isn't God, why hasn't the Lord Jesus come back already? Yeah, because he is. Long suffering to us, word, 2 Peter chapter 3. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know why? He's patient. He's waiting for those who are unsaved to have the, the most opportunities to trust Christ as their Savior. He's patient with his return. Romans 2 tells us he's patient with judgment. Saying he's, he, in, in fact, I'm going, to hold my, I'm going to read those verses to you in Romans chapter 2. You can flip over there if you'd like. Romans 2. God said this, Despisest thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? You notice He said the riches of three things, His goodness and His forbearance and His longsuffering. 
Why? Because He wants His goodness to lead you to repentance. God's patience. He's patient with judgment. Thank God He's patient. He's patient with us as we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful you serve a God who's patient? Aren't you glad that despite our shortcomings and our failures, that God hasn't given up on us? That God hasn't given up on you? When, when we, like Jonah sometimes, have prayed some things that we later are glad God didn't answer those prayers. Now God, God is patient. He doesn't have to learn it. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, have to develop patience. He just displays it. I'm grateful I can count that the God of all grace and the God of all glory is patient with me. So he responded, first of all, with patience. Second of all, he responded to Jonah's resentment with preparation. He prepared that gourd after Jonah made himself a little booth only to destroy it the next day with the worm. And then Jonah was mad because his plant that he had going over him to give him shade, that was gone. Why would God make something, make Jonah happy, and then take it away from him? Why would God do that? Do you understand something? Soon, our plant, our gourd will be gone, but God never will. There's going to come a day when the thing that you centered your life around, the thing you thought was so important to you, won't be here anymore. God still will be. Jonah's happiness was determined by the changing circumstance of life instead of the unchanging God who controls the circumstances. You can't, you can't make, hey, we, we ought to know in Ohio, you can't make the weather the reason you're happy. Help us. We better be, and by the way, don't, don't buy in it. Well, you know, hope oh, Mother Nature is kind to us. Who is that? God controls the weather, friend. It's God who's in charge of all that. He put those planets in space. He controls the circuits of the wind. He, he, he does all that. Ask yourself, what's your gourd? What's your plan? What, what blessing in life, what, what circumstance in your life, what object in your life is are you giving more attention to than you even give to God? That if, that if that suddenly was taken away from you, if that was taken out of your life, you'd say, all right, God, I'm better off dead than living without that. What, what is it that you're placing above the one who gave it to you and who removed it? When God sees that that gourd or that plan has taken center stage in your life, He may just send a worm to take care of it. So you'll see that it's the eternal things in life that are more important, not the temporal. Jonah needed the worm so he'd start looking to God and not the plan. Looking to God in, in, in the circumstance and not the circumstance. So God would say, why don't you, if you thank me, if you thank me for the plan, if you thank me for the gourd, you've got to thank me for the worm too. You, you have to be like Job and say, well, the Lord gave and the Lord taken away. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm going to bless the Lord when He gives it. I'll bless the Lord when He takes it away. Because I'm blessing the Lord. And that was, by the way, that was His family. That was His livelihood. Eventually it was His own health. But He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. In fact, Job got to the point where he could say, though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. I read a quote this week. I'm not sure I'll get it exactly right, but I think I can get the gist of it to you. It said, that disease or sickness that takes us from this life will become our cherished friend in eternity. Because that's what took us to heaven. To be with the Lord. Isn't that good? We say, oh, they have cancer. Oh, they have this. Oh, they have that. And they, 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 they passed away. Oh, that's what took them to heaven. Praise God. That'll be a cherished friend. Why? It put me in the presence of Jesus. That's thinking on the eternal, not the temporal. So God responded to him with patience and with preparation and then with pardon. It's really amazing that God had, had such patience and kindness with Jonah that he, he would have a conversation with him with Jonah with the attitude that he had. It's pretty amazing. God is, God's probably trying to remind him, Jonah, did you forget how merciful I've been to you? Did you forget this quickly? Did you forget what it was like three days and three nights in the belly of that stinking, fishy whale? I could have given up on you, Jonah, when you just obeyed me, but I didn't. I, I could have given up on you when the sailors threw you into the sea. You could have drowned right there. I could have had you swallow more water than you knew what to do with. But I spared you. I came to you a second time. I was merciful. I forgave you and I gave you another opportunity. Why shouldn't I do that with these Ninevites who've repented and turned to me? The New Testament equivalent to this is what Paul said in Ephesians 4 in verse 30 when he said, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. And he says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Why, why should I be tenderhearted? Why should I be forgiving to others? Because God, through Christ, has forgiven me. Those who want to harbor resentment, those who do not want to forgive others and release them, are not thinking about how much God has forgiven them. And how much God has been merciful to them. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I don't know, like we said last week, the thing just kind of ends. The book, it, you kind of want to turn a page thinking there's got to be more here somewhere. It just stops. Did Jonah get right? Did he, did he hang on to the resentment? Did he learn his lesson? We really won't know till we get to heaven, I guess. But I think we also see, God wanted us to see about resentment. And God wanted to have the last word on how to deal with that. But the question is this, how will your story end? Do you identify this evening that you have resentment? 
Is there something that's destroying your peace and diverting your purpose and diminishing your productiveness and distorting your perspective? Resentment is a sin you must deal with. It's just like any other sin. God, God has been patient with you. God has prepared things in your life for you to get you to let this go. God is willing to pardon you and forgive you. Confess, repent, and He'll have mercy. You just, just let it go. Release it. Cast all your care on Him. He cares for you. And unload the resentment. Don't carry it around. You'll have a joy and a peace. Someone said resentment is where is you drinking the cup of poison and waiting for your enemy to die. It's not them. It's you. Ask God to cleanse you and forgive you. Let's not live with resentment. God is good. Amen. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you for this wonderful book of Jonah. We sure have enjoyed going through it these few weeks that we've been here. And Lord, tonight especially, as you dealt with Jonah's resentment, Lord, I ask that you would minister the hearts of people here and their resentment and he has resentment in their heart, they'll want to confess and forsake. But Lord, whether it's resentment against you, resentment against someone else who they believe did them wrong, Lord, may they realize you're in control of their life. And just as you've extended mercy to them and forgiveness to them, they can extend that to someone who's been wrong to them. Oh God, help us to be productive. Help us to have peace. Lord, we want to have purpose. We don't want to lose all that just because we're focused on ourselves and we're resentful.